comments will appear. Hey guys, we're here. We're live from the family chapel. Hold on, I gotta fix my screen. Do not disturb. Turn off. All right, are y'all still there? I'm here. Um, invite family and friends to watch. Um, I haven't been real good about getting it up on the YouTube channel. I do apologize for that. I heard another car. What is that? Uh, date. 24. 24th. Oh, there you are. Oh, come on. Am I yeah. live? Yeah, you're there. I'm sharing. Okay. We're going to talk about the last church, if I can find my notes. <laughs> hey, Maria. Hey, Maria. I'm here with Vicki and Christy, and Pastor David is here today. <laughs> Just can't seem to shake him today. <laughs> <laughs> and she said that while he walked out of the room, I want you to know. Oh, wait. Oh, shh, he's back. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> anyway. So where are we at? We Chapter are. three. Yeah. Right? Chapter three. Chapter three. Yeah, still chapter All right. Three. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, we're still in chapter three. We're, we have we have one more church. It's taken a while to get through all the churches because the churches are so important. Um, they are. We talked about the last of the churches on Wednesday night, and David ministered on the church. <laughs> Don't give him any slack, Maria. <laughs> um. Poor David. Poor, poor pastor. We're so mean to him. Okay, I'll stop jumping around so your cameras don't all freak out and try to catch up with me. Hey, Mona. Um, so tag that you're here so we can um, get started in just a couple minutes. I do apologize. I was running a little bit late. I was still working on face masks. Woo. At some point, I'm just going to say enough. And I'm not making any more at some point. But right now, I still have elastic. <laughs> I still have fabric. I'm still sewing. Yep. Still making. <laughs> so, and I've gotten some of the metal nose pieces to go to help be able to stop the fogging of the glasses and the adjustable nose pieces. So, um, anyway. So, I'll still be making those. Maria, if you need some more, send me a note and I'll send you some. We're going to talk about the church of Laodicea today, chapter 3, verse four, starting in verse 14. Um, we've gone over and over and over the churches over the last couple of weeks, um, Sunday in service. David went through all seven of them. I don't know how he did it in less than an hour. I guess it was close to an hour before he got done. Um, but he went through and, and touched on all of them. I'm kind of anxious to get to chapter four because that's the throne room of God and that's my, like my favorite book in the whole Bible. Awesome. When I talk to kids and I talk to people about scripture, I always go to chapter four and I read to them about the throne room of God because I'm so excited about it and what it, all it says about the Lord. So that's next week. We will get there. And then I realized last week I was prepared for Laodicea, but I realized I had totally skipped Thyatira. So last week I had to back up and do Thyatira. <laughs> so mm -hmm. these are all still available on the Facebook page. I will get them uploaded to our YouTube account um, at Warriors of the Word International, I-N-T. Um, and and I'll, send, I'll put links in the Facebook, on the Facebook for it. Well, let's talk about the Laodiceans. The scripture says, in the, in the Bible it says, it calls it the lukewarm church. One of the authors I was listening to, one of the preachers I was listening to, it called it the hypocrite church. Mm. You know, and a lot of people tell you they don't want to go to church because it's filled with hypocrites. These are the people they're talking about. Hypocrisy comes from a Greek word meaning drama. <coughs> Greek word meaning drama or to mask. And so hip hip hypocrites wear a mask. They're one thing in public, they're another thing in private. They're one thing in front of some people and it's something different in front of other people. They're one thing in church. There's something different in the world. And we all know people that put on those faces. And uh, when we were doing home church, the last time we were doing home church, um, one of my friends called it, this is the church of just be real. And we were. We're just real. And we still are today. We're just, this is who we are. Hey, Joe. Uh -huh. 
We are just real. We have to be. It's so difficult to con- to keep up those facades, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's not what God wants. He right. wants us to be real. He wants us to be honest. You know, as long as we're being honest about things mm-hmm. and giving him glory, mm-hmm. all right? We're not going to be honest about... Uh, you know, I'm not going to be blunt and in your face about stuff that's going wrong or stuff that's, you know, I'm not going to give the devil glory right. by yeah. saying, oh, woe is me. I'm not going to do that. You know, if I don't feel good, you're going to know I don't feel good. You know, if I don't, if I'm tired or scared or worried or fearful or whatever, you're going to know that, but you're not going to hear me giving the devil glory about the problem or the situation. And that's where we have to be real careful. Um, you know, when Jesus was talking and he says, well, woe to the scribes. And he was, he was talking about, he was talking about him being hypocritical. They were one thing in synagogue and something totally different in public. Mm -hmm. Um, the Christian life for a lot of people, we do everything to impress others. You know, we want others to look at us a certain way. We don't want them to know that we're angry with them or we're worried about something or we're frightened. Um, if, if that is, if our goal is to impress others with our lives, then it's not a natural outflow of a Christian walk, mm-hmm. right? It becomes, um, it becomes a facade. And what Christ wants us to do is to be believers in such a way that his world flows out of our lives, mm-hmm. okay? That's what it's, when he's talking about obey me, those who obey me love me. Because we love him, we obey him, and that's what flows into the world around us. And it's really important that we do that. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, that's not what I was looking for. Maybe it's 14. Verse 14? Anyway, it's not neither one of those two scriptures. It oh. talks about our, our being seared. Oh, here four. It's verse four, chapter four, verse two. Sorry, oh, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, four one says, "Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons." Verse two says, "Speaking in lies." Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. If we're not careful, our conscience can be seared, and we begin to believe our lies, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Matthew 7, um, 7, verse 22 and 23. Let's see. It says... Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare that to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He's specifically referring to people who are hypocrites Mm -hmm. who put on a false face in church and synagogue to make people believe that they know who he is okay and jesus will say hey you can do all these cool things but i you know you you are you don't ever want to hear that's right you are operating in lawlessness and he says those who obey me those who love me obey my commands and that's really important that we get there um and he says many Many people will do this, and and the word is um, it's it's mani four one eight three uh, in the Greek in the Greek, which means much, large, or plenteous. He's talking about a whole bunch of people that he's going to say, "I never knew you." Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you profess me, but the pattern of your life is sin, transgressions of the law, of his law. Not, not breaking earth laws or man laws or even morals of the world. You know, that's not his problem. Right. 
when he says you've broke my laws by the way you're doing things um and this church really represents the 21st century church which is who we are now um there's there's many people that say lord lord and he says hey you're you're living in lawlessness uh this author called it a spurious faith and i like that word spurious means counterfeit Uh, it's a counterfeit faith now Laodicea was the final destination on the trade routes Um, it had underground aqueducts that had uh, lukewarm water running through it at the the base see there's a these are fortresses that are built on the top of the cliffs okay and below it the town grows around it in this town they had hot springs and cold springs and the hot springs and cold springs were what the city was known for but up on the mountaintop they had uh, an underground aqueduct that took the water up to the mountain and when as it as it went there it cooled and it warmed up and it became tepid or lukewarm water it also had a very bad odor so he says here in verse 14 and to the angels of the church of the laodiceans write these things says the amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of god when he talks about you know we've talked in the last six churches he always identifies himself and he identifies himself exactly the same way that john saw him back in chapter 1 verses 12 through 18 all right he said i am the amen i am the end of all things i am the faithful and true witness and he said and i am the beginning of the creation of god now there's some faiths that will take that and say okay see jesus was created because he says i'm the beginning of the creation of god and and you've got to be careful with that because that's not what this is referring to the word is hey arche hey arche or something like that probably pronouncing it wrong. It's A-R-C-H-E, hierarchy. And the person, or the, and that, that refers to the person or thing that begins something. So when it says, I am the hierarchy of God, it means I am the one that began all this. Mm-hmm. I, am, I am not the first of God's creation. I am the one who created. Okay. okay? And he wants us to be very sure to understand that. Now the church of Laodicea and all of the churches understood all this because they knew the old testament and we need to realize that when jesus spoke to them it wasn't something off the wall that they didn't understand when we read revelations a lot of it is difficult for us to understand but when the churches heard this stuff they got it they knew exactly because everything in scripture everything in the old in revelation is going to refer back to something in the Old Testament yeah. that they already knew, including the beast with seven heads and the you know, all of the creepy stuff that's going to come. They're going to understand exactly what he's talking about. We have to do a little digger, better digging because we're not Old Testament scholars like we should be. So this churches that he heard, that heard this, now like David had said on Sunday, this was a letter. These were letters written in a book. That went to all of the churches. All of the churches had all of the letters. So oh, that all of everyone right. Okay. So the church of Smyrna what knew what Laodicea was doing. Philadelphia uh, knew okay. what the other was doing. They all knew. Now they were within a day or two's walking distance from each other. I mean, they they weren't that far apart. Mm-hmm. Fifteen miles, twenty miles maybe. So they knew these churches, and the pastors had to stand up there and listen to these rebukes coming about their church. Mm-hmm. And they heard everybody. And they heard everybody else's. Yes. Wow. I, I, David said, "I can't imagine being a pastor that has to stand up in mm-hmm. front of the church and say this is, mm-hmm. you know, this is what's coming." So anyway, then in verse fifteen, he said, "I know your works." He, he tells every single church that I know your I know, works. Yeah. I, I know, know and we works. talked about it in the very beginning. I know is not just a head knowledge; <clears throat> it's he knows the heart behind the works. He said that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And he was giving them a direct reference to the hot springs and cold springs at the base of the mountain. 
and the lukewarm tepid water that was up in the fort up mm -hmm. on top and the the fact that that water became stagnant and stale mm -hmm. and smelled bad and mm -hmm. nobody really wanted to drink it but that's the water they had so here's the deal you can either be hot or you can be cold but i would rather you be one of those two than this stinky water Mm -hmm. Right, you yeah. got you can't stay that way. Yeah. You've got mm -hmm. to pick or choose, mm -hmm. and it's not even a matter of sitting on the fence. I don't believe it being hot or cold. I don't think it's lukewarm as a sitting on the fence. I think it's a deliberate distortion of the Word of God, knowing and still not doing. No, yeah, You're right. Mm -hmm. For instance, when I was um, doing this research, I came across this comment that was made on Facebook by a. a blogger and um i was really really bothered by it and i went to her facebook page and i will look through a lot of her stuff she really believes this stuff so here's what she said excuse me I, this is an example of one of those that'll say lord lord mm -hmm. and jesus will say huh she says i am a christian and i don't go to church i am a christian and i don't believe the bible is the word of god I am a Christian, and I believe, and I embrace sex positively, which includes but isn't limited to sex outside of marriage. She says, "I believe everyone has access to God. Everyone. I, I I am a Christian, and I do as I please, which is not to say that I can harm anyone. This is never okay. Why does that become never okay if there's no standard?" Right? Why is this? Why is this part not okay? Because she's saying she's a Christian. That's right. why she's. <coughs> so it's never okay to hurt anybody. Right. So that's her own personal moral compass. Mm -hmm. And she, her own standard. Yeah. yeah. So she says, "I'm a Christian, and I know Christianity has been used as a weapon of white supremacy for as long as any Christian who isn't actively dismantling mm -hmm. white supremacy is harming people with their theology." Wow. The first Christians were not white. They were Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. They were yeah. Jews. Right. They were Africans. Yeah. They uh -huh. were, you know, this is not a white theology. You know, and I, so I, I take great, I'm very concerned for her. Right, yeah. You know, some of the commentators on TV, I am very concerned for them. I prayed for how long? Bill, uh, for Bill Maher, Maher yeah. for mm -hmm. years for him to come to a realization of who Christ was for years. And they finally, he finally left the air and I thought, well, maybe he is. And then I found out he just went to cable so he can say what he wants. Mm -hmm. All right. A Christian is a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. All right. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments to live, to love the Lord, our God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The rest of the Bible gives us very specific portrayal of what that looks like. And that includes sexual purity. Mm -hmm. We've got to be very careful of where we set our standards. And it's like Landon had spoke on Sunday about um, justification. justification. We justify where we're at, right? Mm -hmm. No matter where we stand with the Lord we or stand in our walk, we justify it by saying, well, I'm, at least I'm not that bad. Right, and that's what the Pharisees did when yeah. they pray. They pray mm -hmm. and they say, "Oh, you know, thank you, you know, thank you, Lord, that I'm not not like this that person on the corner, or the poor person, or the whatever." And just they would justify their position. We've got to watch that because God sees us all as children of God. Mm -hmm. He sees us all as equals, and He still knows our works. And He still yes. exactly. Yes. I know your yes. works. Yep. Verse 17, and he said, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He said, okay, guys, now look, you guys are poor, blind, and naked. You think you don't need anything. You're totally missing my point here, people. Mm -hmm. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed that shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Part of what he was telling this church was very specifically directed at their economy. In this economy, there was a large banking industry and they had gold refiners there. He says, look, guys, don't buy gold from the bank down the street. Buy it from me where it's been refined in spiritual fire. Mm -hmm. 
in holy fire, in the fire of persecution. Look to me. They also had um, an industry there that made the finest black silk wool in the entire world. Hmm. And he says, wait. And buy white garments that you may be clothed, not the black stuff you make, by white garments which are, represent pureness and holiness, that the shame of your nakedness may not, may not be revealed. He's saying, okay, look, it's the holiness that's going to cover you up. And then he says, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. There was a pharmacy industry, and one of the things that they made was an eye salve. So these people knew exactly what he was referring to. And if we look at the scriptures, if we look at the last seven churches, uh, honestly, we're going to find out exactly where we are personally in mm -hmm. these churches. And we can identify ourselves in one of these churches, mm -hmm. whether it's the good, the bad, or the ugly. Mm -hmm. We're part of these churches. Right. And in every church that, he, that we speak to, from the time this was written, every single church has, has been in one of these categories or has people in the church that fall into one or more of these mm -hmm. categories. Okay. So he's not saying something that doesn't apply today. We talked about at the very beginning about how understanding who Christ is now should lead us into worship. I mean, that just, we should just be falling on our face like John mm -hmm. as though dead because of how holy God is and how he is allowing us to study his word and to become closer to him. We should, we should be, immensely um, grateful, all right? So Jesus was saying to this church, talking directly to their water supply, their industry, he, he knows exactly, and these people knew exactly what they were doing, exactly what they were doing. So... Here's this praise in verse 15. I know your works that you are neither hot or cold. He, I know your works. So he's praising them. No, he doesn't praise them. Okay, I take it back. Remember in some of the other churches, he praises them first. Mm -hmm. He says, you're doing these things good. However, never, yeah. nevertheless, but, or but, right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and But in this church, he doesn't even praise them. He said, y'all are, are lukewarm. Mm -hmm. and, and I wish that you were. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And like David said, that ought to terrify a hypocritic believer mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> or a lukewarm believer to death. Yeah. It, it should terrify you into, into holiness. Hey, Megan. So it's crazy that he has to keep saying these things. I know your works mm -hmm. because he wants them. We have to understand that he is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows our hearts. He knows that we, he knows what the motives behind everything we do. Um, he said, I would rather you be indifferent with hostility towards me or hot and boil over with zealous, with zeal for me than to be lukewarm. Yeah. You know that lukewarm Christians are the most difficult to reach uh -huh. because they think they have it right. Yep. Right? We know that. Um, in verse, Matthew 24, 12, it says, The love of many will, will grow cold. Um, the word um, hot Apollo, means fervent or boiling over. Um, Romans 12, 11 says, Be fervent in spirit. Mm -hmm. So there's all of he's He's telling you, he's, our, our zeal should boil over into the good works of Christ, oh God, yeah. all right? Not into self-righteousness or pretend holiness, but into the good works of Christ. And, you know, and that involves caring and feeding and loving and uh, reaching out to, to those who are lost. Um, you know, the, the Bible, <laughs> some people... Okay, some people believe that, and the Bible teaches that, that you can be morally pure, you can be helpful, you can be generous, you can even profess Christ as Savior. Uh, you can, they will even agree that they're a sinner. They will, might work in your church. But the true test is the condition of your heart. Mm -hmm. Is there a passionate love for him? 
we all know people that are just kind of, you know, yeah, I'm a believer. Yes, I do this. I do, you know, I, I'm a good person. And, you know, one of the, the scariest mm -hmm. things I heard was the man tell me, he said, well, yeah, I'm a good person. It's like, okay, well, Jesus doesn't say you're going to heaven because you're a good person. Yeah. He says you're going to heaven because you believe in me. I have a me. lot of people tell me, too, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. That's not what scripture teaches. And, it says, know, do not forsake the gathering of other mm -hmm. together. And the reason he wants us to gather together is so that we build up ourselves. He, we build yeah. up ourselves and each yeah. other. And we build each other up for good works. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. If you're by yourself and you're worshiping the Lord, which is fantastic, and you're praying by yourself, which is incredibly beneficial, but it never takes you out of your closet. It mm -hmm. never takes you out of your home. Yeah. to go, do good works. That's why we come together, mm -hmm. is to encourage each other to good works. Um, you know, there's one church in here, he says, I'm, I'm going to pay you according to your works. Because mm -hmm. the reward will come according to our works. I, You know, I want to be counted for doing good works, right? Yeah, of course. So how do you know if you're a, Christ, a lukewarm Christian or a non-fire Christian? Okay? Mm -hmm. let, me, let me tell you these points real quick. Okay. For Jesus... It's very evident to him, whether you're lukewarm or not. And it shows, it shows you stuff like in stuff that you do, like you're devoted to God. You have an active prayer life. You're humble. Um, you have a growing separation from the world. You know, things that I used to do, I no longer do. Shows I used to watch, I no longer watch. Books I used to read, I no longer read mm -hmm. because I have a growing separation from the yeah. Lord. You love what God loves, and you hate what God hates. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that, and in order to find out what that is, you need to be in the Scripture. Mm -hmm. You're submitted to the Lord. He is not just your Savior. He is Lord of your life. You're everything, yeah. You have a thirst for righteousness. I want to do it right. Mm -hmm. I really do. You're hungry for the Word of God. And, and I have to say that since we've started this study... I have been so hungry for this. I can't, uh, it's constant. You know, it's like more, more, more. Yeah, I crave scripture yep. all the time. Yep, there you go. <laughs> you have a burden for souls. Do you really care about your brothers and sisters going now? Yeah. Do you really care about the people in the grocery store or the, the clerk at the yeah. water checkout or, you know, whatever it is? You have a burden for souls. And the last thing that proves you're a Christian is you have give all glory to God, mm -hmm. right? A non-Christian won't do that. You will hear a non-Christian say, I, 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 me, 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 more than any yeah. other word. They may believe they're a Christian, but these right here will prove it. And that proves, <coughs> proves it to Christ. Mm -hmm. And it proves it to, to the world out there. People that operate in these, this picture of a Christian are not hypocrites. It's not in them. Okay? Mm -mm. And I'll tell you, the I know for me, the closer walk I get, the more the devil's like, oh, you ain't a Christian. You don't know what you're doing. And it's and he does. Con and, and it's mm -hmm. constant. And it's, it's like, and I just say, no, I'm a child of God. You know, I, and, and it's a constant because I, I know that. But I know I'm I have to nudge strong. him off all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the you time. know, and we all do. You know? and, and I have things that come to me too through friendships, through all kinds of stuff. Things have been happening to me. Yep. And mm -hmm. God's been showing me a lot. <laughs> so you know, my my question to everyone that's listening, and and I didn't tell everybody today, but Christy and Vicky are here. Donna's on vacation. Michelle's at work, and David is here today. Yep. Um. So my question to all, to all of you people that are listening is, are you maybe backslid? Mm. Because if you are not zealous for God, moving forward in your walk with him, then you are probably backslid. And that's kind of a scary place to be. And I, I you know, I've been there more than once. Mm -hmm. I've been there going, okay, or my passion has waned, or my zeal just wasn't there, or... I really didn't care anymore. You know, I just, you know, life gets in the way and it gets tough and it's difficult sometimes to get past things that are happening to you and around you. But Jesus didn't say that only when things are going good do I expect this of you. He yeah, said, yeah. this is what's expected. Yeah. 
So, then Jesus talks to them in their own language. <laughs> Remember I, I told you about, he said, you say I am rich, but you're really not, mm -hmm. you know, and he tells them to buy stuff that I have. Um, Jesus knows your outward works, and what he uses to define a Christian, a Christ follower, is our heart. And that's important. He doesn't look at the works that you're doing in the community, even the good stuff. He doesn't look at that stuff. He looks at your heart. What is your reason for doing it? Um, how many times have you known someone who seems to be have everything only to find out they're really miserable? Mm -hmm. You know, we've all, we all know those people that it's like, well, they got it all together. Look at all the blessings mm -hmm. they have and whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what this church was. They looked like they had it all together. And Jesus said, hey, you are miserable, mm -hmm. you're wretched, mm -hmm. you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty serious. When you're wretched, you're vile and despicable. When you're miserable, you have such a spiritual condition that you're to be pitied. Mm -hmm. When These are the definitions of these words. When you're poor, you may look rich, but this word poor pictures a beggar, abject poverty. These were spiritual beggars. It, it's not just they didn't have enough money to pay their bills. I mean, they were desperately poor they, and spiritually. They were blind, which meaning they were unable to see the spiritual truth. They had no discernment. And worst of all, you don't even see your own spiritual condition. You guys are so blind, mm -hmm. you don't even get it. Naked. Um... You know, you're you're undressed before the world. People who are affluent to, affluent tend to believe that God is blessing them in their efforts. <laughs> mm. Do not equate material things with the blessings. Maybe it is a curse. It keeps you from real life, real relying on Christ. I I I often think about the casinos, and you know. <laughs> I could probably go to the casino and lay down $100 and walk out with extra money because the devil wants to trap me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And God will go, hey, sometimes he just turns us over to our foolishness, right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I know that what will happen mm -hmm. with my finances and my walk with the Lord mm -hmm. by, per right. by participating in that. Right. And when David was traveling, he had to go up to... Um, Marksville, I guess, it was a store up there and where the casinos are. And he wouldn't even stay in the hotel of the casino because mm -hmm. I'm not going to give them my money. Right. Right. Mind. So that's that's a standard that we have yeah. that it's we're just not going to do this. Yeah. You know, we're not going to participate in this. Um, We talk, look at the big churches around us and the mega churches and the ultra mega churches and the monster churches and whatever you want to call them that seem to have huge blessings coming from the Lord when in reality they're one of the other churches that are getting along with everybody. They're not teaching holiness and pureness mm -hmm. and stuff. Now there are people in those churches that are still holding fast to the word of God. And they're still hungry for the word of God and they're still learning and stuff. But the, the church, it's the, the, the group as a whole, you know, are missing something. Mm -hmm. But if you think about where are the most vibrant churches today, the most powerful churches today are in communist nations mm -hmm. they're, or Muslim nations or socialist nations because they are in the fire of persecution. Yes. The greatest the largest growing church today is in iran wow. in the nation of iran where they will be killed if they're found out mm -hmm. china has now decided that if you they have a social they have a um, food stamp type program there for the poor people in china they, they help provide for them and uh and they've told them that you have to renounce your Christian faith to continue getting the benefits from the government. Wow. They have told churches that they have to take down the crosses and the images of Jesus off their walls and put up pictures of their communist leaders in their churches, or they will be shut down. 
If you look at the affluent countries that are not under persecution, like Europe and America, our churches are in apostasy. They are totally gone against what God has taught. Um, you know, it, why seek and serve our Lord when we seek his blessing and seek his blessing when we have everything we need? We had a, a missionary come to uh, church a while ago in, in uh, we were doing a small home church, and he said, I feel sorry for you, because we were talking to him about what it's like to live where he's at, and he said, oh, it's tough, you know, you know, we don't have this, we don't have that, and he said, but you know what, the ones I feel sorry for you are you people in America today. My kids are being raised without all of the benefits that your kids have, but they love the Lord, they know how to serve people, they know how to rely on God for prayer, yeah. through prayer. Yeah. So when, where we're at, we don't have medicine. We have to pray for healing. Yeah. Where we're at, we don't always have food. We have to pray for food. Where we're at, we don't always have electricity. You know, when the power is on, we're excited, yeah, right. you know. And so we are so blessed in this country by God because of the foundation of our country, the, the root foundation of it. God has continued to bless us, but at some point he's going to say, okay, mm -hmm. and he will remove his grace from us. He will remove his blessing from us, just like he has doing. He's doing in Europe now. Um, why submit to his lordship when we're free to obey ourselves? <laughs> we just do what we want. Um, why pray when you can fix everything yourself? There are hard times coming for the church. You know, we want revival, but are we ready for the trial and the persecution that comes that precedes it? We've started praying for our church's revival services in October. We just started uh, uh, praying for them again because they got postponed due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And what was that, last week or the week mm -hmm. before? Last, last, last week. week. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so far this week, Vicki's mom has had to have major, sh major surgery. Um, Donna's daughter. Donna's, Donna's daughter, daughter got really sick, and, mm -hmm. and fortunately, thank the Lord that she was, she was okay. Yeah. Michelle's. Sister-in-law, yeah, sister. right? This enemy is coming against mm -hmm. us because he doesn't want us praying mm -hmm. for the revival to come. But we've been praying even harder for That's it. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we, what do we do? Exactly. Yes. This is an awesome prayer team right here. Yes. Let me tell you what. Mm -hmm. If you want to be on our prayer team and get text messages of prayer requests, I'll be happy to add you. It is incredible what's going on with mm -hmm. this group. It, it, they are so determined mm -hmm to push back the gates of hell. Uh -huh. And they are faithful yeah. to do it. They're awesome. They're like, yay. Yeah. So verse 18, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire. He was being a little sarcastic. Uh -huh. You know, he's telling me, I said, look, you guys think you have everything. I'm telling you, if you come to me, I will give you what you need. Um, I will make you spiritually rich. My gold has been refined in the fire of persecution. Um, it's a pure faith that endures hardship, a faith, of, a goal that produces righteousness. Um, your fruit is counterfeit. Buy from me the true faith, is what he's telling this church. Mm -hmm. He said, come to me for the true faith. He says, white garments, he's talking about holiness and purity. Um, the silk garments are okay, in it, but it represents their hearts. And he said, it, it gives the image of the harlot being stripped naked in judgment because mm -hmm. all of our work, their works are filthy rags. Mm -hmm. It gives that image of stripping them naked. The people who received this letter understood exactly what he was talking about, and it was a very threatening letter and very harsh judgment. He said, anoint your eyes with the salve. You're blind. You need the gospel. Mm -hmm. You have to have the gospel to turn from darkness to light. You've got to understand scripture. Yep. Um, so that would be your uh, your spiritual eyesight. Yes, your spiritual eyesight. Mm -hmm. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Mm -hmm. He said, don't be lukewarm, but get real. Be mm -hmm. zealous and repent. The love of Christ still reaches out. Even knowing their hearts, he's still reaching out to them. He said, I rebuke you because it's what is used to convict us and convince us of our unrighteousness. 
and I, he chastens us, which is a corrective action. And he says, I will do what I have to do to get your attention. I used to tell the guys at Ascension House all the time, he said, you've given your life to Christ and he doesn't give any refunds. Therefore, he will make it as difficult as he needs to, to get you where he needs you, mm -hmm. where he wants you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he does it in love mm -hmm. because he knows when you were formed, before you were formed, he knew who God created you to be. And the person he created you to be is not a lukewarm Christian. It's not one that is wishy-washy or does stupid stuff or hangs on to the world. It is one that is zealous and hot, boiling over with fervency for Christ. Because when we do, we glorify God. Yes. Um, he's still reaching out today, and he says, be zealous and repent. Repent, repent, repent. I think he says it a bunch of times in the churches. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. We use that scripture a lot when we're evangelizing and we'll tell people, you know, he's at the door, will you let him in, mm -hmm. right? But this was specifically written to the churches. It wasn't written to non-believers. Mm -hmm. It was written to the churches. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm here. I'm standing at the door and I'm, I'm knocking. I'm, I'm trying to tell you what's going on in your churches, in your church, in your life, in all of the churches. This is what's going on. And so I'm here. His, my grace is efficient. My grace is here. I'm trying to get your attention so that you will come back to me. Mm -hmm. And he says to him, oh, and behold, I stand at the door. Okay, let me go on. I will come into him. When you open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Talk about an invitation to dinner. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. All he's saying is, look, repent. Yeah. Return to your first love. Mm -hmm. Do the things you did at first. Hang on. Throw out the Jezebel. You know, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. All of the churches, he's told every single mm -hmm. one of these churches, and he says, I'm knocking at the door. Mm -hmm. If you will do these things and let me in. We will dine together forever. Mm, thank you, and then verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. And what did Christ overcome? Death. Sin. Sin. Our sin. He yeah. overcame yeah. death. death. Yeah. He yeah. went yeah. to hell and took the keys Jeez. away from the devil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He overcame. Overcame. Right? He knew he was going to the cross. He knew he was going yeah, to die okay. for the sins. He knew all of this. And then he went one step farther. And he went to hell and got the keys yeah. to death back. So that we will never die. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. It was the last church, I believe. Um, uh, which, which was the church that says, I will give to you to eat the tree of paradise? Uh, first okay. Yeah, it was the first or second church. And the tree of tree of which is in the paradise of God. Yep. And referring to Revelations 22, where the tree of life is in the center of the is in the center of heaven. That was his intention all along: is that we would never die. Mm -hmm. We were never supposed to die. But Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and because of that, God said, "Okay, you can't live forever knowing this." Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, that's why he had to put them out. Second Peter three nine. You know, we think sometimes that God is delaying. He's taken his you know, I know there's been generations in the past that thought, you know, believed that Jesus was coming quickly. Because he says I'm coming quickly. And we're they were anxious for the return of Christ. But in chapter three of first second Peter it says Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before of the, by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Where is this Christ that's coming? 
this King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Everything's going on just like it used to. For this they will willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of earth, water and in the water by which the Lord that then existed perished being flooded by water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by that same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of God, ungodly men. Verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He hasn't forgotten what he told us. As some count slackness, but he is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Christ will not come again. The second coming will not happen until the fullness of the Gentiles has been reached. And we have no idea when that's going to happen. But as we study Revelations, we're going to find out that it's coming quicker and quicker. But God's window of grace is still open. Mm -hmm. He's still calling people. He's still waiting for us. Um, and he says, the church of Laodicea, the church of apostasy today, the 21st century church says, this church had nothing pleasing to Christ, but he was still knocking and telling us to repent and we will have fellowship forever Judgment will be coming, the true church will be gone, and then he will pour out his wrath. I'm, I'm, I'm of the mind of the, the rapture, the pre-tribulation, the post-tribulation, the mid-tribulation, which we'll get into as we get a little farther in. The different theories, the different ideas, the different eschatology on, on the tribulation, I, I, I don't know. I've read so much that I'm totally confused by it. All I know is the word of God and, and I kind of hope it's true that we're out of here before <laughs> the wrath hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But church, I am not. That's what I was going to ask. Are we going to be here during tribulation? I don't know. Yeah, I kind of hope we're not. Right now. I, I, I kind of hope we're not. I, I don't know that I believe it, I but I kind of hope it's true. <laughs> You know? oh, I hope so, too, so we yeah. have got to be prepared yeah. Yeah. in the in the event that the pre-trib rapture is not a true doctrine. We have to be prepared that the mid-trib rapture may not be true. And we have to be prepared that it may be when the millennial starts. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't we don't and we're gonna get into more of more of that. And um, when he says they will come in and dine with them, he's referring to the marriage supper, in, which is in Revelations 19, mm -hmm. where we're all going to sit together. Um, not a, he's, verse 21, he says, um, come and sit on my throne. He's not talking about only fellowship with Jesus, only fellowship with him and his dad. He's talking about ruling and reigning in the millennial for mm -hmm. him. He said, you will enjoy my fellowship, rule, and reign with me. And he tells that to one of the other churches. I think it was, uh, might have been Thyra, yeah, Thyatira. He says that you, if him who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Yep. That's what he's referring to. Mm -hmm. Daniel 7, um, 20, let's see if I didn't mark that. I didn't mark it. Daniel 7, 27, it refers to, uh, is what this refers to is that he's going to give the power over to the people to rule. You know, judgment's coming. And after we get through the throne room of God, we're going to start reading about the judgments that are to come. And we need to be prepared spiritually, mentally, and physically for the judgment that's possible. Spiritually first. Because if we're prepared spiritually, we're going to have the works done that we need to have done. He's still offering us grace. He's still reaching out. He's still reaching out to the the lukewarm church, the apostasy, apostasy church. He's still reaching out to the non-believers, to the lukewarm believers. He's still reaching out 
with his grace today mm -hmm. through us. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we have to be zealous for the things of the Lord, not for any other reason than that's what Christ wants. Mm -hmm. He's using us to reach the lost. And if we're not willing to do that, then you have to question whether you're Christian or not. Yeah. You can't be a Christ follower and not follow him into that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do appreciate your time today. Maria, I will be happy to add you to our prayer circle, be, prayer group, because you are a powerful woman of God, and we need yeah. all the help we can get some days. Mm -hmm. The devil is sure hounding us, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I do appreciate everybody that's been listening. Um, next week I'll be broadcasting from Florida. I'll be back at my dad's. He's not doing well. His time is short. Um, please keep my mom in prayer, Joanne. She's She's having the hardest time of all of it. And my yeah. brothers and sisters also, they're going to have a hard time too, I'm afraid. Um, but I know where my dad's going. Amen. Amen. I know who he, I know who, where, I know what he's doing. The moment he yeah. takes his last breath, last breath on earth, that earthly body is no longer necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. He will be in heaven with the Lord when he takes his next breath. Amen. So, and I, I do appreciate that. And I appreciate his legacy of making diligent zealous efforts in reaching all of my brothers and sisters mm -hmm. so we, we we owe that those of us that are saved have praying grandparents somebody praying parents praying. somebody yeah. was praying oh yeah and we owe that to the people coming after us mm -hmm. to be praying for their salvations that they be turned from darkness to light from the power of satan and death into life thank you so much and we will talk to you all next friday have a blessed week.